start with a question. How do you solve an issue like world hunger? Now, in the year 2004, I went on this mission trip to the Philippines, and it was a blessing for me. I'm sure I received far more than I gave. One month in the Philippines, I was there with a priest and a number of other seminarians who were, who were there. We were going to schools, putting on retreats. We, we helped build a classroom. We even helped build a, a home for a family that lost theirs in a typhoon. And so there we were one day, carrying cinder blocks and gravel and, and everything, and going back and forth. And the dad of the family, he was just so deeply moved by what was happening. And he turns to one of my brother seminarians, and he's just saying, Salamat, Salamat, which means thank you in Tagalog. And, uh, and tears streaming down his cheeks. And the seminarian, he responded with enthusiastically, he said, Masarap which means delicious. I think he meant to say, you're welcome. Walang anuman. But anyways, this, this poor guy, he, he had this confused look on his face, like, what's, what is, what's that mean? But, but there we were. Another thing that we did, uh, speaking of delicious, we set up this feeding program at a school. And so many of the children, beautiful, joyful children, they show up at school, they haven't had breakfast, they uh, haven't packed a lunch. Their families have so little, and they can barely focus or stay awake in the classroom. And so we provided a, a simple meal for them, this program that started. And, and after having done that, I didn't feel like, oh yeah, this is so wonderful. We've done so much. I, I actually felt this is so little. It's one school in one country of, I think at the time, 85 million people, I, I looked it up, now the Philippines, more like 110 million, of, of, out of so many countries worldwide where children and adults experience hunger daily. How do you solve a problem like world hunger that just feels so overwhelming? And I don't know about you, but I just feel so tiny next to something like that. Maybe, maybe there's another issue that you can think of where you feel overwhelmed by how big the problem is. It's so complex, and there isn't an obvious solution. You feel overwhelmed, insignificant, so far beyond you. Just to be real for a sec, you know, being the pastor here at St. Benedict, this is how I feel a lot of the time. This huge parish, and I'm not looking for, for pity, for sympathy. I feel very encouraged by all of you, very affirmed. But it's like most days I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no clue. Uh, I, nobody prepared for me. I feel so underqualified. I hope it doesn't show that much. But, uh, but it's true. And yet, here we are, having just barely survived a two-year pandemic, dragging ourselves out of it, slowly emerging, and then the other day, Father Alex, he's preaching away, yelling at us the whole time, and he just says, and we need to reach 60,000 people just in our immediate region, our immediate area. There's 60,000 people who need God, and we're called to go reach them. And I'm thinking, take it easy. Like, <laughs> like this whole bold new vision thing, like, SBP is this explosively alive parish where, where people discover Jesus, become missionary disciples, go out to transform the world. It's like, I would rather a modest, safe vision. <laughs> I would much prefer that. I mean, just think about it. It, it. it feels like we're trying to solve world hunger here. It's virtually impossible. 60,000 people. Do you realize we can fit about 600, 650 people maybe in this church? Even if we rented out the Scotia Bank Center where the Mooseheads play, we had five masses every weekend to max capacity. We still couldn't squeeze in 60,000 people. And that's assuming that all of these people were actually eager and willing to come. They were champing at the bit, wanting to come to church. And yet we know so many, because of scandal, because of hurt and suspicion, they're, they're not interested. 60,000. We haven't even seen 1,000 people come back in person, maybe 600 joining us online. Are you starting to feel the gap between 
this crazy, bold, new vision, and where we are, reality, can feel so overwhelming, impossible. I feel so small and insignificant next to it. And I wonder if that's how the apostles felt in our gospel today. You know, they take stock of the situation. There's this gigantic crowd before them, and they actually figure, you know what, why don't we just send them off to some nearby villages. They can go buy a shawarma or something, maybe a doner, and, uh, and that's the only way that, that they'll be fed. It's, it's, I think, a pretty good plan. It's modest, it's safe. If I was there, I probably would have recommended the same thing. But Jesus has a bold new vision. He's talking about the kingdom of God, and he's about to demonstrate the kingdom of God in their midst. So he instructs this group of 5,000 to sit down, and by the way, in the original Greek, this is not a sexist comment, in the original Greek, uh, the 5,000 refers to 5,000 individual males. So they're not even counting the women and the children. Who knows? The crowd might have been more like 20,000 people that day. And yet Jesus performs this, this miracle. There's this explosion of food on that day. This miracle with bread where there's so many leftovers, 12 baskets full. I'm sure they had enough for lunch the next day. Uh, it's amazing. And this miracle is a foreshadowing of another miracle, what we call the sacraments of the body and blood of Jesus, what we celebrate today on Corpus Christi, also called the Eucharist or the Blessed Sacraments. Just, just look at these verbs for a second that are used. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples. Now what does this sound like? In one of the Eucharistic prayers, Eucharistic prayer three, we often use on Sundays, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, you see the connection? This is a foreshadowing of the Eucharist. Jesus is foreshadowing this explosion of spiritual nourishment that is to have a ripple effect down through the ages. Not only did Jesus feed 5,000 or 20,000 or whatever that day, Jesus has fed billions of people for 2,000 years with his body and blood. That same God who took on flesh and dwelt among us, fed thousands that day, he can do it again. And he wants to do it again, not just to perform some miraculous picnic for us. Jesus wants to feed us, to nourish us spiritually. He has the power to do the impossible, to make this little parish become explosively alive, and to have a ripple effect around the planet and for years to come in such a way that all kinds of people who are hungry will be filled will be satisfied by Jesus. Now, going back to the gospel for just a second, the apostles, they present this problem, and they even propose a pretty good solution. You know, send them to the nearby towns. And Jesus says this in response. This is so striking. You give them something to eat. Now, he knows full well that they can't. They don't have the resources. They're inadequate. The problem is overwhelming. But I wonder, was Jesus testing their hearts to say, like, are you really with me? Are you all in? Are you willing to try to, to give whatever you have to join me in doing what feels impossible? Will you contribute your, your five loaves, your two fish, your gifts, your talents? Will you give that? Because if you just want to play it safe and modest, you're in the wrong game. But if you want to follow me, I'm looking for people who will surrender their, their preconceived notions, their limitations for what's possible. I'm looking for people who are willing to go for it, to, to lean farther into the Holy Spirit than ever before. Jesus 
is saying to us, to our issue of 60,000 people, I believe Jesus is saying to St. Benedict's Parish, you, give them something to eat. And my answer to Jesus is yes. And I don't even know what that means. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know the plan. But I say yes. You can have Jesus. My, my little offering, my, my few gifts, my few talents, you can have it. Yes. And I believe that if I keep saying yes, if you say yes, if enough people start to say yes, I believe Jesus will spark the explosion. That this parish will become explosively alive in a way we've never seen before. People are going to walk in off the streets. They're going to experience this explosion of love. They're going to feel warmly welcomed with hospitality. They're going to feel like they belong, like they've come home. The music, the worship, from, from the moment of that first note being played, people will be drawn into prayer, into worship. There'll be an explosion of singing, not just the amazing band we have, but the whole church singing, worshiping God, the preaching. Let me just say, it's not going to be this humdrum drivel that we're used to around here. The preaching is going to be amazing. Whoever it is who's preaching the Word of God is going to be preaching in such a way that hearts are pierced, that, that missionary disciples are unleashed, because for a missionary disciple, Sunday is just the first day of the week. And this explosion of faith is going to be like they're, you're carrying torches out into your everyday life. There's going to be everyday evangelists sharing the love of Jesus wherever you go. The heartbeat of St. Benedict will be the Mass, the Eucharist, and yet uh, from that we're going to have other experiences of prayer, perpetual adoration, 24-7 people getting down on their knees begging Jesus for this revival. We're going to see signs and wonders. I believe people will experience healings. I don't know if you, you knew this. I just found out a couple days ago, Deacon Ronan had this ex inexplicable healing a few months back. He never told anybody. He was on Alpha, and there's this, this opportunity to pray for healing. He had this chronic neck pain, and it went away. And he was kind of skeptical, so he, he kind of figured out, I'll just give it a couple days here give it a couple weeks, he gave it a couple months. And I expect that we're going to see more and more of this kind of thing. God's going to give visions and images to people as a sign that, that he's with us. Just about a month ago, a lady came up to me in our parish, who is relatively normal, and she said, you know, Father, as you were lifting up uh, the host and the chalice, I could see it. I could see Jesus, his corpse, just, just laying there. You were lifting him up. Another man recently said to Father Alex, similarly, at that same moment, the elevation, he said, I could see blood coming down your arm. And these little, little reminders that this is real. Jesus is really here with us, truly present in the Eucharist. We dream that St. Benedict Parish is going to be a pilgrimage site. Just imagine, you know, those pilgr pilgrimage sites of old, the Holy Land, Rome, Santiago, Lourdes, Fatima, where thousands of pilgrims approach every year with expectant faith. And they're filled with a new hope. I, I believe that that's going to happen. And just in the last few weeks, we've had people join us from Anaganish, from Montreal, from Toronto today. You know, two priests, one from Toronto, one from France. You are signs, your early indicators that maybe we're on the right track, that maybe this bold new vision, it's not that crazy because it's something that God is, is calling us to, and he's going to provide. I see more and more events where people will discover Jesus. We'll, we'll create this space where we can celebrate the things that God has already done and create room for God to, to touch hearts uh, in a new way. And I'm super pumped. There's this event this coming Friday. 
The whole parish is invited, by the way. You're all invited to join us for Proclaim this Friday, June the 24th from 7 to 9 p.m. It'll be, we'll start in the foyer, we'll, we'll move into the church, there'll be lots of time for fellowship, and, and we're going to celebrate with those who have just finished Alpha, hear some of their stories of what God is doing. If you love praise and worship nights, you're going to love this event because there's going to be some extended time for worship. And then uh, there's going to be food, I heard. So if nothing else, come, invite a friend. It's going to be awesome. As we start to move towards this bold new vision, people who are hungry, people who feel an emptiness, a void, they will start to be filled by Jesus. St. Benedict Parish is an explosively alive faith community where people discover Jesus, become missionary disciples, and go out to transform the world. I want to end with uh, this short video. This is a compilation from Pentecost. And as you watch this, I just want you to imagine, what if every Sunday here felt like a Pentecost celebration. Let's dim the lights and we'll play the video. So much joy and peace in the spirit right now. Nothing huge, but just a general sense of life, and I'm really happy. <laughs> I'm so touched when you know Ellen, uh, you know, got up and went to the front because it's uh, it's celebrating, you know, the spirit working in her life, and uh, I think it was encouragement for others. You know, the Holy Spirit is just continuing to lead me um, to where God wants me to be. Uh, they're a Divine Renovation Parish. My pastor, Father Dominic Barber, is doing beautiful work there, him and his pastoral team. And I received the great gift of working with him during that time of communal discernment and setting the foundations for parish renewal. Recently, this uh, past Easter, when the Eucharist was being blessed, I I experienced a phenomenal thing with you when you were lifting the yeah. lifting it up, and I could just see blood pooling, and it was pulling down your hand, and it, it made me have reassurance that he's with me all the time. When I was asked to open my hands to let him in. I just felt some goodness and I, I felt something, I can't describe it, but I really brought it to my heart because I know he was there through the prayers that you were given up on the altar.